February 1991. Under the burning Iraqi sun, dark shadows streak across the vast golden expanse of desert dunes. In a sky crowded with sleek stealth fighters and state-of-the-art supersonic jets, the U.S. Navy's Attack Squadron 46's weapon of choice is perhaps a surprising one, the LTV A-7 Corsair II. Nicknamed the short little ugly fella, it was labeled as too slow and too awkward to be a war hero, even in its 1960s heyday. Yet here it is three decades on, hurtling towards Saddam Hussein's forces on the front lines of Operation Desert Storm. Speed has never been their strongest suit, but this won't be a battle won by velocity. As pilots give the command, the A-7's mighty payloads come raining down, reaching their targets with unforgiving precision, each explosion confirming their status as the ultimate bomb truck. As their throttles push forward, the Corsair's engines are pushed to their limit, echoing across the desert as the pilots get ready to take on their next target. They may be flying an unlikely warrior against one of the largest armies in the world, but they are determined to prove these rugged underdogs still have some fight left in them. The Need The Corsair II's origins lie in the early 1960s, as Cold War tensions reached astronomical levels. The Kremlin had begun moving its key facilities and strategic targets further in from the coasts, while Soviet air defenses were becoming increasingly sophisticated, especially with the development of the SA-2 surface-to-air missile, which had shot down an American U-2 spy plane in 1960. With the threat from their communist rivals growing rapidly, the U.S. Navy was concerned that its fleet of Douglas A-4 Skyhawk light attack aircraft would no longer be up to the challenge. It had a relatively short combat radius, a low payload capacity, limited all-weather capability, and a lack of sophisticated electronics for penetrating the ever-thickening web of advanced Soviet radar and missile systems. Significant support for the development of a new attack aircraft came from the Kennedy administration's Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, who pushed the Navy to view the matter as a priority. In response, a specialist team known as the Sea-Based Air Strike Forces launched a comprehensive study in late 1962, establishing the potential characteristics of a new aircraft to replace the A-4. After meticulously analyzing 144 possible designs, considering both their capabilities and their costs, they reached an unexpected conclusion. It flew in the face of the conventional wisdom of the day. In an age when most aircraft designers lived by the mantra of faster is better, it must have come as a surprise when the research suggested that keeping an aircraft below the speed of sound could actually yield superior results. The benefits were compelling. Without the complex engineering demands of supersonic flight, they could create a smaller, simpler airframe that was not only cheaper to build, but could move from drawing board to flight line much more quickly. The Navy would be able to afford to purchase these aircraft in greater numbers, and most importantly, the design could prioritize what really mattered, the precision to strike targets with accuracy, making every attack count. Based on these findings, the following May, the Navy put forward a draft requirement for the new aircraft they envisioned, which they called VAL, heavier than air, attack, light. However, with U.S. defense strategy primarily focused on nuclear deterrence and the Navy's funds spread thin over projects such as the Polaris submarine program, the new Forrestal and Kitty Hawk class supercarriers, and the infamously expensive F-111B fighter program, the budget for the development of the A-4's successor was minimal. Therefore, in order to keep costs as low as possible, a major restriction was placed upon any company wishing to submit a proposal. It must be based on an existing design. Nevertheless, several major U.S. aircraft manufacturers decided to enter the contest, with Douglas, Grumman, North American, and Vought all sending in their ideas. After several weeks of deliberation, Vought's design was selected as the winner and was subsequently awarded a Navy contract for initial production in March 1964. The Design Now designated A-7, Vought's new aircraft used their successful F-8 Crusader as a template. While the Crusader was a fighter, at the core of its design were the foundations of an effective attack aircraft. It offered a sturdy airframe, good visibility from the cockpit, and the ability to carry heavy weapons loads. Therefore, Vought designed the A-7 with the same configuration, the same shoulder-mounted wing, 
similar tail surfaces, and the same basic fuselage shape that identified it as part of the same family. Both aircraft shared powerful flight controls and folding wings for carrier operations. Yet that's where the similarities ended. Where the Crusader had been long and graceful, the A-7's fuselage was notably more compact and bulkier, with a blunt nose that made it look rather ungainly. When pilots saw it for the first time, they quickly dubbed it the Short Little Ugly Fella, or Sluff for short, a nickname that would stick with the aircraft for life. Nonetheless, their initial mockery would soon turn to affection, as they realized that beneath this seemingly awkward appearance lay a masterpiece of practical engineering. With speed no longer the primary concern, the A-7's wings were allowed to spread to 39 feet, a full three feet wider than the F-8, increasing the aircraft's endurance. Their gentler backward angle and signature notched front edge gave Vought's design exceptional stability during the demanding maneuvers of ground attack missions. More importantly, these wings could hoist a powerful arsenal of up to 15,000 pounds on their six hardpoints, leading to the A-7's fearsome reputation as the ultimate bomb truck. Another area in which Vought's new aircraft broke with its F-8 predecessor was its engine. Instead of the Crusader's gas-guzzling, afterburning-equipped Pratt & Whitney J-57, the A-7 prototype used a single Pratt & Whitney TF-30 P-6, a more economical option. Trading away supersonic speed bought something far more valuable, the ability to stay in the fight longer. But the real revolution lay in the cockpit. The A-7 pioneered technology that would become standard in future warplanes, but seemed like science fiction at the time. Previous attack aircraft required pilots to constantly glance down at their instruments while simultaneously trying to find targets and avoid enemy fire, a dangerous divide of attention in combat. The A-7 was set to change all that with its transparent heads-up display that projected flight data directly into the pilot's field of view. Gone were the days when pilots had to calculate bombing solutions mentally. Now, a sophisticated targeting computer could do it faster and more accurately than any human. This digital brain was married to a custom-built radar system and one of the first moving map displays in combat aviation. Before the A-7, pilots had been forced to navigate like sailors in the days of old, using paper charts and manual calculations, but now they were able to track their precise position, transforming their ability to fly through hostile skies. These innovations weren't just new gadgets, they fundamentally changed attack missions. While other aircraft of the era relied on speed to escape danger, the Vought design team built an aircraft that could outsmart rather than outrun enemy threats. The state-of-the-art targeting computer that vastly improved bombing accuracy also meant pilots could strike from safer distances. Where faster jets like the F-4 Phantom had to dive in close to their targets, the A-7 could deliver its weapons with pinpoint precision from standoff range. Even if enemy fire did find its mark, the aircraft was built to take punishment and keep flying, with triple backup flight controls and carefully placed armor protecting vital systems. Taking off. Amid the relentless demand for Cold War era innovation, the development of the LTV A7 was defined as a remarkable feat of speed, precision, and effective management. The US Navy, wary of the skyrocketing costs and chronic delays that had plagued former projects, established a groundbreaking fixed price contract with LTV, leaving no room for missteps. This deal was highly unusual, making the aerospace conglomerate fully accountable for any delays or missed targets in their ambitious quest to push aircraft design to its limits. The Navy's penalties for failure were steep. Every day of delay during inspection trials would cost LTV up to $50,000 per aircraft. Missing the weight target would result in a severe $750,000 fine, mirrored by the same amount for unmet maintenance standards. Ultimately, LTV exceeded the weight limits by 600 pounds, but the design team, led by Sol Love, insisted it was a strategic decision. The additional weight reinforced the wings, giving the A-7 a remarkable payload capacity. The gamble paid off. Love's foresight and structural integrity spared the Navy from costly wing modifications throughout the A-7's career, consolidating the plane as a robust and adaptable aerial weapon that, valued at just over $1 million per unit, became one of the most cost-effective aircraft of the time. In 1965, 
Vought christened the A7 as Corsair II, paying tribute to the legendary lineage of war aircraft that had come before. The original Corsair, the Vought O2U from the 1920s, was a biplane scout and observation aircraft relied upon by the US Navy and numerous air forces worldwide. This versatile warbird, adapted to amphibious missions, was an invaluable asset for coastal and maritime operations, effectively inserting itself in battles across the globe throughout its operational life. The next addition to the family arrived in the 1930s in the form of the Vought SBU Corsair. This sleek, all-metal biplane became the US Navy's first scout bomber to shatter the 200-mile-per-hour barrier. Faster, tougher, and better suited for naval warfare, the SBU laid the groundwork for dive bombers in years to come. However, the Corsair lineage hit its peak with the iconic F-4U Corsair. With its unmistakable bent-wing design and an unprecedented reputation for speed and firepower, the F-4U became an aerial legend. This fighter bomber saw intense combat during World War II, where its crushing hits and broad agility made it a favorite among pilots. Revered by the U.S. Navy and Allied forces alike, the F-4U continued its reign into the Korean War, placing the Corsair name in aviation history, a legacy that the A-7 would carry on. Upon the official induction of the aircraft into the Corsair dynasty, the first prototype took its maiden flight on September 27, 1965. As test pilot John Conrad guided the plane through its paces, engineers and onlookers stared up with mouths ajar. The aircraft, with its unconventional silhouette, soared with ease, demonstrating that beneath its blunt exterior lay a marvel of aviation engineering. Shortly after, a high-profile public demonstration brought Conrad back to the cockpit, showcasing the A-7's prowess to a marveled crowd of a thousand guests. With six 250-pound bombs and 12 500-pound bombs strapped to its wings, Conrad piloted the A-7 through rapid rolls and complex maneuvers, emphasizing its agility even when laden with heavy weapons. Being capable of carrying twice the load of an A-4E Skyhawk or extending its range with the same payload, it soon became evident that the A-7 would become a star player within the Navy's arsenal. The A-7's initial success was so astounding that the Navy's initial contract of seven prototypes and 35 production units was gradually increased reaching a final request for 199 A-7A aircraft. Although some Navy officials lobbied for a more gradual rollout to perfect the A-7's avionics, this campaign would prove to be short-lived, as the urgency of the Vietnam War called for an immediate deployment of warplanes to Southeast Asia. By October 1966, enough A-7s had been delivered to establish the Navy's first operational squadron, and upon confirming that the planes were combat-ready, they were shipped to Vietnam to support the American campaign. Vietnam Crucible The Corsair first entered combat skies in late 1967, diving alongside Fleet Squadron 147 in a mission over North Vietnam. The target was set on critical communication lines near Vinh, serving as veins of enemy intelligence supplying the North Vietnamese war machine. This aircraft sliced through the humid air, its fuselage gleaming as it unleashed its payload over enemy territory for the first time. Bombs plummeted, sending shockwaves through the jungle and announcing the Corsair's arrival on the battlefield. As part of one of the war's most extensive aerial bombardment campaigns, the Corsair entered rolling thunder in its later stages. It carried an arsenal that included Shrike anti-radiation missiles, escalating the destructive power of its aerial attacks and paving the way for American air superiority. For over three years, the skies over North Vietnam were filled with U.S. Navy, U.S. Air Force, and Republic of Vietnam Air Force planes, hammering the adversary's supply routes, industrial infrastructure, and air defenses in a relentless effort to obliterate North Vietnam's ability to sustain the war. Back home, the Vought plant worked around the clock to keep a steady supply of A-7s rolling off the line, employing 35,000 workers to produce one aircraft per day to meet the demands of the war. 27 U.S. Navy squadrons received A-7s, each new model equipped and adapted to overcome the grueling conditions of combat abroad. Still, the Americans were falling behind. Despite the Corsair inflicting heavy damage in the region, Operation Rolling Thunder ended in November 1968, failing to force North Vietnam into submission. 
It wouldn't be until 1972, when the A-7 evolved with advanced variants that included enhanced cockpit instrumentation and precision targeting capabilities, that the aircraft had a chance to redeem itself during Operation Linebacker, an effective resurgence of U.S. air power aimed at severing North Vietnam's remaining supply lines for good. This time, the full power of the aircraft was fully unleashed, with the A-7 weaving through clouds and delivering precision hits on critical targets set to crumble North Vietnam's resistance. In a climactic strike, four A-7Cs from Squadron 82 unleashed an 8,000-pound payload on the Tan Hoa Bridge, a notoriously resilient structure that had withstood years of bombing. Equipped with walleye-guided bombs and Mark 84 general-purpose bombs, the A-7 zeroed in on the bridge's weak points, shattering its western span and finally removing it as a lifeline for North Vietnamese forces. As the dust from Operation Linebacker settled, North Vietnamese leaders found themselves compelled to reconsider their stance, and pressure began to build, pushing them closer to the negotiating table. Yet, the A-7's capabilities extended far beyond bombing missions alone. Just a month after Linebacker was concluded, the A-7 showcased its versatility in a combat search and rescue mission. The operation aimed to reach the stranded crew of a fallen Republic F-105 Thunder Chief, its twisted wreckage lying deep within hostile territory surrounded by enemy forces. Major Colin Clark's A-7 braved relentless bursts of 12.7mm anti-aircraft fire for over eight hours, its fuselage rattling with each near-miss and grazing hit. Circling low through a storm of tracer fire, he descended into the jungle, guiding the rescue team through the chaos toward the stranded pilots below. The daring mission cemented the A-7's reputation as one of the most resilient warplanes in Vietnam its endurance under fire unmatched. Clark's bravery and unbreakable resolve in the face of lethal danger earned him the Air Force Cross. Navy pilots who commanded the A-7 lauded the aircraft for its ease of handling, excellent forward visibility, and fuel efficiency. The turbofan engine offered a level of range and endurance that set it apart from earlier jet aircraft, allowing it to lounge over targets and provide prolonged support. However, the A-7A wasn't spared from criticism. One of the A-7's most notable shortcomings was its lack of thrust. However, as the conflict in Southeast Asia intensified and more aircraft arrived, newer models began incorporating advanced technology to address the limitations of the earlier versions, delivering increased power to meet the demands of combat. Continuous Improvement After the initial 199 A-7A models were produced and delivered, Production shifted toward more advanced versions of the aircraft, which would go on to dominate the skies of Vietnam during the final years of the war. By 1968, the first A-7Bs were deployed, building upon the foundations set by their predecessors and entering combat missions with enhanced capabilities. The A-7B brought substantial improvements over the A-7A. Equipped with an upgraded TF-30P-8 engine, it boosted thrust to 12,200 pounds, providing better takeoff power and improved fuel efficiency. Outfitted with cutting-edge radar and navigation upgrades, the A-7B brought a new edge to the battlefield. Its precision tech, including improved flaps and tactical air navigation systems, gave pilots the power to find and strike targets with lethal accuracy, even through the dense jungles and rugged landscapes of Vietnam. The A-7's success over Vietnam didn't go unnoticed. The U.S. Army, eager to give ground troops the perfect close air support weapon, saw a golden opportunity. At their urging, the Air Force commissioned its own version of the A-7 in 1968, creating the powerful A-7D, a new breed of subsonic support built to dominate the aerial battlefield and strike fear into the enemy on the ground. The Air Force's A-7D didn't just replicate the Navy's A-7B, it elevated it to unprecedented heights. By swapping the Navy's TF-30 engines for the more potent Allison TF-41A1 turbofan, the A-7D offered an additional 2,900 pounds of thrust, giving it better performance and reliability under combat conditions. This increase in power allowed the A-7D to carry even heavier payloads, delivering increasingly devastating hits during bombardment missions. Its upgraded avionics suite included the advanced ANASN-91 navigation and weapons computer alongside the AN-APG-126 radar, enabling precise all-weather operations. 
For added firepower, the A7D replaced the Navy's twin cannons with an M61A1 Vulcan 20mm rotary cannon, giving pilots devastating firepower at the mere flick of their fingers. Impressed by the powerful upgrades made for the Air Force's A7D, the Navy found their own A7s almost unrecognizable in comparison. Determined to match the performance and firepower of the Air Force's new version, the Navy set out to bring their Corsairs up to the same cutting-edge standard. However, delays in getting the powerful new TF-41 engines meant the Navy had to improvise with an interim model, the A7C. This version blended features of both the A7B and A7D, equipped with a cutting-edge heads-up display and improved flight controls, while still using the hydraulic systems and ejection seats of earlier models. At last, in 1969, the Navy unveiled the A7E, a fully loaded powerhouse that set a new standard in aerial warcraft. Armed with the mighty TF-41A2 engine, this upgraded beast boasted greater thrust, higher payload capacity, cutting-edge navigation, and targeting tech, making it a true force to be reckoned with over Southeast Asian skies. During the Vietnam War, the Corsair earned a reputation for delivering firepower with unmatched accuracy, dropping more bombs per mission than any other American attack aircraft, and placing second only to the B-52 Stratofortress in sheer ordnance delivered. Despite America's eventual withdrawal from the war in 1973, A-7D pilots returned home with their heads held high, knowing they'd flown one of the undisputed heroes of the war. Throughout the conflict, the A-7D proved to be nearly indestructible, engaging in nearly 13,000 combat missions and sustaining only six losses. American troops may not have reached victory in Vietnam, but the legend of the Corsair was cemented in military history forever. 80s Engagements Throughout the late 1970s and into the 1980s, the aircraft that had been designed for a cheap, quick solution just kept proving its worth. When U.S. forces launched Operation Urgent Fury in 1983, a lightning intervention to rescue American medical students and counter communist Cuba's influence in Grenada, A-7 screamed low over the Caribbean. Their precision strikes neutralized Cuban anti-aircraft positions at Point Salinas Airfield. Despite newer, faster aircraft joining the fleet, the reliable slough remained the Navy's go-to platform when accuracy mattered most. The following year, amid Lebanon's devastating civil war, A-7s from USS Independence patrolled the troubled waters offshore. As rival factions threatened American diplomats and Marines in Beirut, pilots used their advanced flight navigation systems, now decades old but still remarkably effective, to maintain a protective umbrella. 1986 brought Operation El Dorado Canyon, the U.S. response to Libya's sponsorship of terrorist attacks against American citizens in Europe. A-7s from USS Coral Sea would demonstrate that their long legs could make up for their lack of speed. Denied the direct route by European airspace restrictions, these subsonic veterans had to weave their way through the Mediterranean. Yet, while faster aircraft needed tanker support, the A-7s were able to press on on their own and their efficient engines allowed them to reach their targets in Benghazi with fuel to spare. Operation Desert Storm But it was Operation Desert Storm in early 1991 that would provide perhaps the Corsair II's finest hour. The Cold War it had been designed for was now all but over. The Soviet threat it was built to counter had now collapsed, yet here was the slough still on the front lines of a new mission to defeat Saddam Hussein's Iraq after its invasion of Kuwait. Day and night, A-7s from the U.S. Navy attack squadrons 46 and 72 zoomed across the Iraqi border. Some of these aircraft had been flying since the Vietnam War, yet they maintained an astounding 95% mission-capable rate throughout the conflict, higher than many of their more modern counterparts. Using the same precision systems that had revolutionized attack aviation decades earlier, these veteran warbirds struck Iraqi defense sites and infrastructure with pinpoint accuracy. During the ground war, their ability to orbit slowly over the battlefield for extended periods became a crucial advantage, allowing them to provide persistent close air support for advancing coalition forces. Service record and lasting impact. Desert Storm would be the Corsair's last dance in American colors. The Navy's final A-7 squadrons, 
BA-46 and BA-72 flew their last combat missions in May 1991, while the Air Force finally retired its last Corsairs in 1993. In the Navy, the venerable warrior was replaced by the F-A-18 Hornet, which drew lessons from the Corsairs' advanced targeting capabilities, adopting improved displays and radar systems to uphold its lethal reputation. However, the A-7's influence would extend far beyond its replacement. The A-10 Thunderbolt II and even the stealthy F-117 Nighthawk benefited from its legacy, with their pilots conducting training and fly-offs against the aircraft that had helped write the book on precision attack aviation. However, while American A-7s were heading to storage or museums by 1998, the Corsair's story didn't end there. The aircraft would continue serving with several foreign air forces well into the 21st century. Greece, Portugal, and Thailand all operated this type of aircraft, with the Hellenic Air Force particularly impressed by its capabilities. The Greeks would keep their A-7s flying until 2014, making them the last operators of the aircraft that defied all expectations by seeing an impressive 47 years of service. It was a fitting end for the short little ugly fella. Despite entering service at a time when supersonic jets were seen as the undisputed champions of ground attack, the A-7 Corsair proved that raw speed wasn't everything. And after nearly five decades of service, this slow but mighty powerhouse earned its place at the top ranks of naval and aerial forces worldwide. In the end, the A-7 proved that a true combat legend doesn't need a sleek silhouette or supersonic speed, but rather the grit to get the job done time and time again. And that's precisely what the Corsair II did. <laughs>